Hey everybody, welcome back. To Northern Lion plays a Binding of Isaac Adderworth Plus. You know, we had a good run. A meditative run is the Forgotten. Ooh, we're gonna be a... I was gonna say a front half character. There's no character that's more front half than Isaac, baby. There's your seed. CWR7, JGHD. You know, I, I cannot complain. All I'm asking for is exactly what we've received. And that's like a few runs without being the Keeper. <laughs> If we could get to five runs without being the keeper, even if they're not all wins, I would I would allow a keeper run. I mean this I mean I'm not gonna disallow it no matter what. I don't really have control over, you know, the probability. Um, but I mean there's like eleven characters in the game. I don't think I'm asking for that much. Oh absolutely. Let's let's get weird. So Libra early allows us to I mean it puts another wrinkle in things, right? Like we gotta think about uh, how the items we take now will affect all of our stats. So some of the items that were previously pretty freaking good are now gonna be horrible and vice versa. You know, like anything that gives us a huge negative in one department for positive in another might not be worth taking. But hey man, that's what the D6 is here for. No, 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 no. Okay, well, really, here's my... There's a Ragman recipe, okay? As long as you hit one of the two parts of Ragman with your bombs, you're doing just fine. So, it, in turn, I mean, you don't need me to tell you this. You've been watching for a long time in all likelihood. I don't know how much new user acquisition is being driven by the Isaac brand at this point, at least until the DLC comes out. You know what I'm doing here, but getting Blood Bag will be a huge get. We don't necessarily need speed specifically, so to dilute that speed across all other attributes would be would be real nice. It'd be a good time. Definitely. Um, we definitely do not care at all about uh, wooden nickel. We're not going to get another reroll in all likelihood. Dude, underrated aspect of Libra, by the way. No, okay, we got so lucky to not get hit. All the freaking bombs, you know, and helped us out a great deal. Okay, so I think now we definitely won't buy... We don't need to fight you. We definitely won't buy a spirit heart. I'm not confident in the existence or location of our uh, secret room, but the second secret room should be here. I'll try him. Oh, that's... Uh, I mean, it's bad for damage. Everything else didn't get too screwed. That's nice. Oh, hell, hematemesis. Would have been nice to take it later, but whatever. We gulped a decent trinket and we're on our way out. Now, if you want to make up for the negative of getting that speed down pill, one more play. You got to give it one more play. All right, fair enough. Um, you could have given me blood bag there, but that's okay. We're going out on the next floor. We got another good chance at an arcade. Everything's going fine, except for the fact that our damage, and this doesn't happen that often, but our, our damage is actually lower on floor two than it is on floor one. In fact, if you want to get technical, all of our stats are lower. I don't know if we can make it, but... Look, I deserve to be rewarded for that. Was not rewarded. That's life, you know? That's a muscle that needs to be trained as well. <laughs> we put in the work and did not get the reward. But sometimes we won't put in any work and we'll get like Polyphemus. So, you know, you, you take the good with the bad. And you just hope you get a little bit more column A than column B. In Isaac, at least. In life, I think, you you know, you accept that sometimes it won't happen the way you want, but if you're consistently getting, you know, screwed over while putting in a lot of effort, that's very frustrating, I'm sure, so. That's, that's an Isaac life lesson, specifically. Um, okay, I'm gonna go straight for restock. I'm hoping we get a little, you know, rich on this run, basically. That's not that bad, because it doesn't affect our other stats, but. Now, I do want... A bomb. The bomb should... Okay, especially now. Well, you know what? Now that I think about it, we got Ace of Clubs. 
So if we find an arcade, we can get a lot of bombs. But we also kind of need some HP in the process as well. Anyway, we're, we're talking a lot of Isaac. Don't, don't get too disheartened. It's going to change. Like, really, all we need is a deal with the devil that's not a uh, ghost baby and, you know, it follows or whatever that, the, the shade. If we get something that actually affects our ability to hurt enemies, I'll be a happy man. I really cannot justify using Ace of Clubs on a battery charge. Like, who knows what we're going to get in this shop. You're all, you're this item room. You're always going to want to have more rerolls. It just opens up a world of possibilities for you. Like, that's not very good. That's extremely good. Okay, so now our damage, and I don't know, this might actually give us an all stats up for every single kill that we get. Let's, let's check it. This is a perfect room to check it on. Oh, it does. <laughs> Alright. Now, it, it, to be fair, our tiers don't get upgraded every kill. In fact, they might only get, up oh, they get upgraded like every seven kills. So, not really that relevant on a lot of rooms, but, but all your other stats get something out of it. Um, so it's, it's very, very solid. Just waiting. I want a room with a lot of bomb opportunities for Ace of Clubs. Because as of right now, like... You know, we're... Got a lot of Tinted Rocks. We got a lot of good bomb opportunities accepting that. Um, want to take advantage of it for sure. Anyway. You might ask NL, how's your how's your IKEA trip? How did your IKEA trip go? It hasn't happened yet, okay? Thank you for uh, for asking, though. In a moment of human sympathy, I really appreciate it. You know, you gotta accept, though. And I didn't really say this in the last episode, and I should have. But you're not in traffic; you are traffic. If you're going to IKEA on a Saturday, you gotta accept that you're. You're part of the issue, you know? You're you're a member of the crowd as well. And they, probably half the people in the store are going like, Why do we have to come on a Saturday? This is ridiculous. Yikes. So yeah, I always think like, you're not in traffic, you are traffic. It makes you feel better about the whole situation when you get, you know, stuck in gridlock on... Highway 99, and it's not even rush hour. You're like, what are all these people doing here? And you're like, yeah, you're here too, though. And you're like, yeah, but I did, you know. <laughs> but I need to be out right now. Hold on. Okay, okay, it's good. It's good. It's good. No rerolls required. That's very nice. Base stats are looking lovely right now. Um, and, and this probably cements this run as being close to untouchable, I think. Even though, and I mean, there is a real problem. The real problem is, uh, a lack of red hearts, obviously. But apart from that, like... That's really good. We got a super great setup. Our, all of our stats are lovely. Definitely do buy this, then go for this. We did get the money out of it, which is very nice. Do we want to buy anything else? I don't I don't really think so. So, you know what? Yeah. Give me two more of those. Call me in the morning. That's not how it works. <laughs> ah. You don't say that to your doctor. Hey, give me, give me two of those. Call me in the morning. Well, I don't know. You, you probably could. I guess it depends on how shady your doctor is. I just watched that documentary on Netflix, Screwball. About the baseball steroid scandal. Thought there was another tinted rock, but whatever. I was like, you know, I bet you could ask that doctor for something and he would give it to you. Oh, we'll crack that open. If you haven't seen it, I mean, he's, ba he's just the... I mean, he's a doctor, but he's like... I don't want to say he's not really a doctor. But he was kind of the central figurehead during, like, the Alex Rodriguez steroid scandal. Um... It's kind of, I, I don't, as weird as it sounds, I don't want to be rude to the guy, because, you know, I don't, I don't know him as a human being. Even after watching the documentary, I wouldn't deign to know. But people keep calling him not a doctor. He is a doctor. He just deliberately went to a non-American, easy medical school in order to get his degree. 
which I think renders him unable to practice traditional medicine in the United States. But he does have a medical doctorate. To, to say you're a doctor might go a little bit too far. Anyway, the point, that's not the point. The point is he's basically just giving his uh, athletes a bunch of steroids. Which is, and they knew, according to the documentary at least. It's pretty wild to think that like... Every athlete, when I was a teenager, might have been on performance-enhancing drugs. People that watch hockey kind of have a little bit of a, a snobby approach to it, because the sport has been relatively untouched by, you know, performance-enhancing drug, you know, failure tests, test failures, I should say. Um, the only one I can remember is that. At the 2002 Olympics, Jose Theodore tested positive for something that can be used to mask performance-enhancing drugs. And then he was like, yeah, it's Rogaine. And you're like, oh, sorry, dude. <laughs> I don't know whether, you know, that's honest. I, uh, you know, I am not the head of the IOC, Dick Pound, which is his real name. I don't, I guess, you know, at some point... People are probably like, why don't you go by Richard? And he's like, it's my name. You know? Why do... I'll, you know, I don't care what these people make fun of my name for. I'm the head of the freaking IOC. Regardless. Um, or, I don't know. He wasn't part of the IOC. What was he? I mean, he was part of the IOC, but Jacques Rogue was the IOC chairman. Anyway, this is all irrelevant. But, you know, have you guys seen Icarus? Icarus is like an insane documentary. If you haven't seen Icarus... It's one of the wildest documentaries I've ever seen in my life. On the surface, it's about steroids in cycling. Uh, but like... <laughs> I don't even want to say below the surface. But slightly below the surface is actually like an expose of, of a corrupt nation's government, more or less. And like, kind of makes a sham of the entire 2014 Olympics. Uh, except for the part where Canada won... Double gold medals. But anyway, in, in men's and women's hockey. That part is still definitely cool. But I, I still, you know, I think it's naive to think, uh, you know, NHL players back in my, uh, you know, back in my youth weren't on something. I'm not, they, they have different physiques than baseball players. You know, if you look at some of those baseball players from like, uh, like Jason Giambi is all in Kose Canseco at like the peak of his career. It's not nice to say that they were not, like, human beings, but they were, like, like, two enormous arms and, like, an incredibly broad chest just attached to, like, a normal human being skeleton. <laughs> when you look back now, you're like, at the time, I was like, I don't know, you know, there's, uh, the doctor says they did the steroids, but they say they didn't. I don't know. It's anybody's guess. Now I look back, you know, you look at, like, a lot of baseball players now versus, you know, baseball players around 2002, 2003, even up to, like, 2007 with Barry Bonds, and you're like, yeah, okay. That's fair. I think, <laughs> I think they probably had him pegged, in hindsight. Anyway. I don't know, maybe it's a touchy subject. I don't think it's a touchy subject at all, but I, you know, I might be ignorant to that. Um... Like, sometimes people are like, you know, I don't get why, you know, why aren't they allowed to do steroids? Like, if steroids make the sport more entertaining, we're getting so lucky on this chariot card, dude. If steroids make the sport more entertaining, uh, why not let them do it, you know, for the entertainment value and, like, if they're doing it safely under doctor supervision, then, you know, whose business is it, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know... I think when I was 16, I was kind of in that camp. I was like, dude, I don't care if they're doing steroids. I just want to see home runs. Now that I'm like, I hope a little wiser, a little bit more mature. I'm like, yeah, but if you let the people in the majors get away with steroid use, then people in college are going to be taking PEDs without the same level of supervision. And then people in, you know, high school are going to start taking... Uh, PEDs so that they can get into the colleges because they got to compete. All the 
Mikey's taking uh, steroids right now so he can be the best third baseman in the county. Well, I got to start. Otherwise, you know, who's uh, Indiana University going to take when it comes time to give out scholarships, you know? And then you're like, you, I don't know, you're, you're starting the free base, you know, horse testosterone with like your nine-year-old kid hoping that he gets to be the next uh, A-Rod or something like that. So, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where as I've grown up, I've been like, yeah, you can't really just tolerate the steroid use. It's, I mean, should the athletes be using it in the first place if they're adults with the, uh, hold on, this is important. I, didn't we have a black rune at some point? Where did that where did that go? I want that. You know, they're they're adults, they can live with their choices. It gives them an advantage, of course, but maybe if everybody else in the league is using it, then you know, it, it, I'm not going to say it's okay, but it, it kind of justifies it for them, I suppose. Um what is this? Pheromones. Pheromones. But then the 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 trickle down effect of uh Basically what I'm saying is I don't want to see any seven-year-old kids with mustaches hitting 50 dingers a year. You know, they should be in school. I don't, I don't want the Oakland Athletics drafting uh, a kindergarten student. He's got bigger biceps than Hulk Hogan. Plus, even the, the dingers didn't make baseball that entertaining. <laughs> For me, at least. Don't, don't shoot the messenger, okay? Finally, we found our item. I can't believe this is Flooded Caves 1. We, we lost a lot of momentum here. I'm going to take this. One of the reasons I like it right now is because it's uh, stat independent. So we'll get a little bit of an extra damage bonus in spite of the fact that it's not actually a damage up. And all of this upgrades won't be diluted across multiple stats. Yeah, sure. This is, I mean, it's an all stats up, I assume. Yeah, dude, 0.5 damage is no joke whatsoever. Come on. I mean, I don't even want a black market out of this. I just, like, A was. Figured you might as well try for something. You know what I mean? Anyway, if you haven't seen it, Screwball is a fun documentary. Icarus, it'll, it'll, make you, it'll make you think a little bit. There's a lot of interesting characters in that. Oh, good, it's Abel. Just when I thought the run might be entering a little bit of a, a touchy period, is Abel here to save the day. I don't know, man. I'm just saying, if you're an NHL fan and you're like, at least my business hasn't been struck by, you know, performance enhancing drug use, I'm like, I think you should consider yourself lucky that the height of like. PED hysteria happened when the NHL had bigger problems because they canceled the whole season due to, you know, the players and the owners not getting along. I still, I know you might be like, oh, please stop with the sports talk. But it still, it just blows my mind that it's like a billion dollar business. And then like for a year, they were like, nah, we're just not going to work. I get it's more complicated than that, but. And baseball had a strike too. But the NHL lost games to strikes. They lost a whole season of strikes, and then they lost a half season to strikes within the same 10-year period. That's just like, come on. <laughs> Can't we... I don't know. Obviously, these guys know the business way better than I do. Can't you get, like, an independent arbiter to just, like, sort it out? I don't understand, like... And to be honest, the game has become better as a result of those strikes. But the cost was also... I mean, a heavy price was paid, let's put it that way. Losing a whole season? Ruined a lot of guys' careers. Well, I mean, they kind of ruined it themselves, but you know. Like, 2003, B-plus player. 2004 to 2005, no games played. Might as well have a few Bud Light Limes. 2005, 2006, you come to training camp like 75 pounds overweight. Makes it hard to recoup, but anyway. Where was I going with this? I don't know. To be honest, I kind of ran out of conversational topics. This run has stalled quite a lot, to be honest. And uh, I'm just waiting for something to really push us over the edge and give us something else to talk about is really the way it's going. Hold on. I have five Discord messages. That doesn't happen that often. Oh, you know what? It's just it's Simvicta. And he's talking about Dicey Dungeons. It's a great game. 
I, I, I love hearing stories of people's dicey dungeons runs. You know what? Thanks for the segue, Simvicta. I talked about it a few episodes ago, but that game is super duper good. Honestly, it, it, it's a crowded year, and I haven't played nearly enough of it to be like, it's a potential game of the year candidate. But like, I don't think it's quite at the level of game of the year candidacy for me. I really, like, to be honest, the more time goes on, the more I cement that, at least for right now, and we're getting, you know, more than halfway through the year, almost two-thirds of the way through the year at this point, Slay the Spire is still my, my game to beat. I think it might actually, and, I, you know, I don't think I'm going to be the, the only person thinking this, but I think it might actually be, like, the my favorite game design ever like not a, not of this year but like 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 of all time the fact that even though it's frustrated me so much it still ends up being so replayable is just like nuts to me now i like sekiro a lot actually there's been other stuff as well i'm trying to think of i mean i didn't expect to come into this talking about you know like game of the year stuff but help help me <laughs> I didn't have a list prepared, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, Baba is You is another game that's just unbelievably well designed, for sure. But I think sometimes people, you know... I, I think the traditionally game design awards, depending on the outlet giving them... Uh, I mean, it's pretty bad. Uh, they, they often get conflated. Like, game best design is just like a second, like, game of the year for a lot of places. Or it's like, hey, what game had a weird gimmick and was also pretty good? And Baba Is You is in the second camp. It's not really a weird gimmick. It's, it's a novelty, for sure. And the game is amazing. But at the same time, I think Slay the Spire, if, if you look at that game and, you know, I mean, we can agree to disagree. But if you look at that game and, and the choices that they made during development and you don't see... You know, the the kind of design genius, and I don't, I don't use that word lightly. I thought about whether I was going to use the G word. Then um, then we're on different pages here. Again, I kind of just... <laughs> Isaac is also a well-designed game, although I've had some problems with it recently. Eh, that's fine. Um, but I, I always... I, I equate Slay the Spire as like the anti-Isaac. Isaac is like... Mm, what if we had nine range upgrades? What if we had nine items that did exactly the same thing? And then Slay the Spire is like, oh, we have we have one card that does this, and no other card does this, and this doesn't do what any other card does, you know? And then, you know, they, they could easily, if they wanted to make their game worse, but maybe, like, hype up their marketing, they could be like, we're adding 100 new cards! And then just have them be like, slightly tweaked versions of cards that already exist, but that's that's not what that game's about. That game's like, is like a deck of cards. It's like if you went to your friend's house and you're like, hey, check it out, you got a deck of cards? Well, I brought another deck of cards. Like, you know how it goes up to, it goes from ace to king? Well, now it goes, you know, from ace to king, and then from king to scientist, and then from scientist to president, or something like that. All your friends would be like, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is going to help out our game of Texas Hold'em. <laughs> the deck of cards is a tool that's already, you know, it's perfect for what you want it for. Please, God, stop with the unknowns. I'm dying. I'm dying to know what to be able to use my D6 for. So I, I, I really think that for me... Slay the Spire is still heads and tails up there. That being said, I think Dicey Dungeons is a, is a much easier sell for a lot of people, and I, I understand and do not begrudge them. Slay the Spire, you kind of look at it and you're like, I don't really get it, it looks a little flat. I, I see criticisms of that game, because I, I go to the subreddit for Slay the Spire all the time still, and uh, I see discussions of it elsewhere, and I see things like, uh, you know... Well, Slay the Spire is great, but, like, the enemies don't really make coherent sense in the world. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, and it's a valid criticism, I suppose, even though I don't understand it. But I kind of feel like it's like going to, like, a, a really amazing restaurant. 
and being like, why is there a portrait of Elvis on the wall? Or something like that. It's like, who cares? You know? It's, that's not really relevant. I, I don't know. I don't really care that much about the, the, the tchotchkes. Man. They're getting real interesting with the, these curses. I hope we're not missing out on anything fantastic here. I, I refuse to take one. It's just a... It's close to a death sentence. Okay. We made it to the depths extremely late, but not with Curse of the Unknown this time, which is fantastic. I'm not hand-waving any criticisms about Slay the Spire away, by the way. I'm just saying. You know, if, if what you're looking for in that game is a game where... Oh, but what... I don't understand. Do the birds evolve into the cultists? Or, like, where does the jaw worm fit into this? And you're like, nah, nah it's not like... It, 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 every one of those enemies is just an abstraction of a way to test your deck, you know? This tests uh, how, how well can you deal with uh, status effects. This one tests how well can you deal with uh, rare big attacks. This one tests how well can you deal with uh, many frequent attacks. We don't want to use our roll too fast. I think we want to get something... I mean, these are good items, but I'm kind of swinging for the fences, honestly. We maybe should have taken the HP up, because it also... I'm, this is the item I'm happiest with, to be honest, but... We maybe could have also made a case for um, stem cells, because it gives you a shot speed up, so it might have given us uh, enough to get a tiers upgrade, or, you know, it would definitely give us a little bit of damage and speed, whether or not you consider that to be relevant, and... It depends how much it, it is, to be honest. How, how much, what the magnitude of the gain is, I think. But um, it, the the pencil, I think, is a really good get for us here. We really got to be a little cautious about our HP. Very happy I did not take a deal with the devil on the last floor, sight on scene. Unless it gave us HP or respawnability, I feel like it would be a the wrong decision right now. Oh, interesting. Let's try. Anyway, I always, I, I apologize, because I, whenever I bring up Slay the Spire, I always gush about the exact same thing. I always gush about how little content there is when it comes to, you know, enemies and cards, which seems like a weird thing to compliment, but... I, I really see it as, like, if, if you want to equate it to, like, a restaurant meal, Slay the Spire is all meal, no garnish. Presentationally, I think it's fine, but a lot of people seem to have a problem with the art. Um, but it's, I, for, and this is not necessarily a fair metaphor, but for me, I'm like, you're complaining about the plate that's housing one of the best steaks I've ever eaten. Like, I get it. If you could choose between having a crappy plate or having an awesome plate, you'd rather have an awesome plate. But my perspective is, I don't care. But, you know, I'm getting uh, beside myself. Beside myself? That's not the phrase I'm looking for. I'm getting tangential to the original point. Yo, curse immunity, thank you. Um, and what is that original point? Well, really the original point is that Dicey Dungeons is also very good. It's been a good year for roguelites. I mean, Slate Aspired came out in early access, like, a long time ago. Like, two... Yeah, almost two years ago, I think. But still. It's been a good period for roguelites. I like that we're getting into an era, I think, where, you know, I really feel like... Roguelites from, like, 2014 to 2017, a lot of them, and don't be mad, but what I'm about to say is a little rude, a lot of them were just like, hey, it's Isaac Spelunky or FTL, but not quite as good. That's not to say that they're bad, but sometimes, you know, I, if you're making a game and it ends up is heavily inspired by a game that's endlessly replayable, uh, and your game is just that but not as enjoyable, it sucks. And that's, I mean, I mean, it sucks in a cosmic sense. Not that the game is bad, but rather that it sucks for you, because like, you know, you you might have made a nine out of ten, but your closest. Uh, Comparison is a game that's a 10 out of 10 that everybody knows and loves. So, you know, it's, it's a really hard way to kind of like, you know, it's hard to break into that sort of genre, I think, unless you got a masterpiece. So I really, 
I appreciate that now we got some roguelites that are a little bit more deck builder driven. Now we got some roguelites that are dice driven, you know? Not that they haven't existed for a while, but I feel like it's been more of a confluence this year. Let's put it that way. I just think it's been a good year for games. Easy rerolls, at least. Eh, if it were earlier, I would take Guppy's head, but for now, I don't think we can justify it. Now, how has it been for AAA games? Oh, dude, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> there's Sekiro. That's a great game. Um, I guess you wouldn't really count Cadence of Hyrule as a as a AAA game. A little biased because my wife worked on it, but you know, if she's asking me, that's my game of the year. Who else, or what else has come out? Resident Evil 2 Remastered was very, very good, but it is hard to shake the idea that it's not really a remake. It's, it's like... I mean, it, it obviously is a remake from a story and, like, mechanic standpoint, but it has new content and a completely different way of playing the game, so... It, it's more ambitious than just like, hey, we updated the textures. But it's a great game. And I hear Fire Emblem Heroes is awesome. Mortal Kombat 11 was good. Dude, I can't believe I forgot about Super Mario Maker 2. I mean, that's... Super Mario Maker 2 has got to be... That, that's probably my favorite AAA game of the year. Even over Sekiro. I always feel like I gotta end, you know... Don't, uh... Oops. If you're in the opposite version of this camp, that's totally fine. I'm not mad at anybody for this. But I feel like oftentimes, uh, games that end up being considered for, you know, like, oh, single player game of the year, end up largely being something that's a, like an emotionally driven story game. Or like a really, really ambitious open world title. And that's all well and good. It's not necessarily my platonic ideal for video games, but, you know, for a lot of people, that's that's big. I actually think I'm going to take one up, believe it or not. I'm, I'm that anxious about this. And for me, I almost feel like, from a like contrarian standpoint, that makes me want to be... Uh, it makes me want to lean into the side of myself that is almost entirely mechanics driven. Like, I love games. I, it's a ridiculous sentence, but I love games with mechanics. You know? It, when it comes to, like, if you gave me the choice between, like, a cutscene or, like, a cool lock picking uh, mini game, give me the lock picking mini game any day of the week. And I think that's why, like,. You know, the classic example of a game that I totally misjudged audience fervor for, and I still think it got a bad rap, but, like, it is uh, Tumble Seed. That game is 100% mechanics, and the presentation is nice as well. But people, you know, when they watched it, they're just like, it's kind of boring, I don't get it. And I'm like, well, if you're playing it, you would get it, it's a lot of fun. So for me, like, I think a lot of people might discount Mario Maker 2 as, like, a quote-unquote legitimate Game of the Year candidate. Because, you know, what the story mode kind of sucks. And, uh, you know, Mario's wife doesn't die to give him motivation to get revenge on Bowser. You know, etc, etc, etc. Honestly, I just don't think the jawbone is worth fighting for. That's why I'm not going back for it right now. If we had a reroll, we would have used it there. But we use it on Tammy's head instead because I want to keep the D6 rolling. Rather than uh, get rid of it. Although the item would be quite nice, to be honest. Um... I, I'm, it, it kind of pushes me even more to be like, I think Mario Maker 2 is fantastic. Now, is it what most people might consider a legitimate Game of the Year candidate? I honestly don't know. I think I might be super wrong in thinking that Mario Maker 2 needs somebody to come out of the woodwork and defend it. But we'll see come December is all I'm saying. Or rather, the second week of November, when ad rates go up and websites start to push their Game of the Year lists in order to get maximum CPM, in spite of the fact that there's still like 12% of the year left. It's wild to me, as well, that, like, in a few months, we'll start getting, like, your 2010s, best of the 2010s lists, right? 
That's, if you're dependent on your age, this might be like the first time you've ever been an adult when like a best of the decade list has come out. It's only the second time for me. I remember, you know, New Year 2010, end of the year 2009, all these websites start to come out with, you know, best albums of the 2000s, best video games of the 2000s, etc, etc, etc. It's an interesting time to think back on like the previous 10 years. To be honest, I'm like unqualified <laughs> without going back into like the stuff that I've played over the past 10 years. But like when I think of the past 10 years of games, obviously like, it, it should go without saying that Isaac is on there in a big way. Like that that would make the list for me. I'm not, I'm, this is an unranked list, just to be for the record. But you know, Isaac would certainly be on the list. Spelunky would certainly be on the list. Um, I don't care if the Flash version came out in 2009. Meat Boy would definitely be on the list as well. All of those games have had a huge uh, impact. And I know a couple of people are going to be saying, well, Super Meat Boy didn't come out in 2010. It came out in 2009. Go look it up. I'm not talking about the freaking Newgrounds version. I'm talking about Xbox Live Arcade. I was there! Oh, I guess I was wrong. That's all I ever asked for, okay? A apart from that, another- something that might surprise you a little bit. I think of, uh, you know, The Walking Dead from Telltale Games Season 1. It's a little bit of, of a melancholic thought because of the fact that Telltale Games, you know, went from Kind of being like a niche adventure game publisher to like having one of the most popular game franchises in the world to uh, not being in business over the course of a decade. Um, oh god, let me go. But I def like I think that game. I don't know if it had a huge impact on uh, the the you know shape of the industry, but it was a definitely like a a cultural kind of touchstone. And, you know, do you get games like Life is Strange if you don't get, uh, if you don't have The Walking Dead Season 1? Probably not. You know, for a while, I mean, it got ridiculous, obviously. It got to the point where there was, like, a Telltale game coming out, like, every three weeks. Game of Thrones, Batman, Borderlands. Borderlands? Borderlands, uh, The Walking Dead uh, Season 5, uh, you know, uh, this time, it, it's, Clementine is, uh, a ghost, you know? That's not a spoiler, I never played past Season 1, but... That's definitely gotta be in there. I'm trying to think. Obviously, like... I think when it... You, you know, you mark my words, okay? You mark my words. When it comes to the year or the decade end lists... I think my hunch right now... Is that I mean obviously stuff like uh, Breath of the Wild is gonna make a is gonna make big waves, but I really think God of War might be the one that people go. And like I mean The Last of Us as well, but I think the God of War is gonna get even more of a higher profile. It's just my two cents, and I'm not saying it doesn't deserve it. But hold on, we can already fly. No matter what it was, we were probably going to take it, but we got we to gotta pay a little attention here. When I think of single-player games from the past decade, there's a little bit of recency bias because it's, it's fairly, you know, recent. But I definitely think... Uh, well, I think this is better for us. Um, I definitely think that, that God of War has a chance to be amongst the, you know, three to five games that is... You know, winning most of those accolades. I'm trying to think of what else even would be there. Maybe Mass Effect 2? When did Mass Effect 2 come out? That's that's still a game that's, you know, beloved. 2010 was a long time ago, dude. We're, we're talking about, like, you know... I think it might be like Assassin's Creed 2 Brotherhood territory. <laughs> So you're like, uh, you know, you're you're delving deep. Like the the 2010s, with the exception of Assassin's Creed One and maybe Assassin's Creed Two, have been have contained like 15 Assassin's Creed games. 
I think we actually do want Temperance here. It's contained almost the entire rise and fall of the uh, respectedness of that franchise. Rise, fall, and might I add, re-rise, you know? Like, uh, after Brotherhood, people were like, this is sick. After Revelations, people were like, okay, well, it wasn't that good, but it's the conclusion of Ezio's story, so this, uh, you know... Well, we'll give them one, you know, just to get the story done. But now let's do something interesting. Assassin's Creed 3, people were like, eh, I don't really like it. Assassin's Creed 4, people were like, this is maybe the best Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed, uh, I don't, now I'm like getting confused. One of them was France, one of them was London. People were like, ah, I kind of don't like either of these ones. Then uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey came out and people were like, this one's amazing. <laughs> what, a, what an interesting franchise. I hate fighting slow Isaac, and yet I keep taking items that make him slow down. Anyway, it's interesting. I feel like, you know, I, I've been doing this full time since like 2000, the end of 2011, which is absurd. So this is like a, the one of the few situations where I feel like I actually have a chance to like weigh in. <laughs> As, as almost a source, you know? Those two, 2010 to 2011 games, I'm a little spotty on, but everything else... Oh, I mean, obviously, this is what, exactly what you're looking for at all times. It's a plus 16 damage upgrade. And also, rate of fire got, like, three times faster. We do have one up, so I'm not sweating getting hit too much, but we'd rather not be forced to use it before it gets, you know... We get close to the end, you know what I mean? That's helpful. It's a great run. Um, will I make a best of the decade list? No, probably not. It's a lot of work. Just to have people argue with you. I used to be, like when, like best of the 2010s music lists came out, I was way more into music. And I was like, come on, dudes, where's apologies for the Queen Mary? Now I have no idea. What's my favorite album of the 2010s? I mean, I guess it's the Pimp a Butterfly. But I don't know if I've listened to... Uh, the entirety of any other album that's that's come out in the 2010s. Well, that's not true. I have listened to Good Kid, Mad City. I don't think I've listened to anything else except, like, Neil Sisierga albums. Just Kendrick Lamar and Neil Sisierga, and then, um... You know, bunch of pavement, <laughs> bunch of 90s rock radio, and then, like, depending on how much I need the boost, maybe a little bit of... That's supposed to be Master of Puppets, but it's not really getting the riff across. Anyway, hey, thanks for watching. We won. If you enjoyed the episode, click the like button. I'm the radio. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. See ya!